and welcome to season three of Super Pros Bros. I'm player one, Ike, and with me, as always, is player two, Eli, and uh, Broham. Do you know this podcast is on YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify? Okay. <laughs> I did not, Brotendo. Are those the same places they could like, comment, share, and subscribe? As a matter of fact, it sure is. That's, that's such, what a twist. My life is so much different now than before. So much different now. So much different now. How is your life different now than the last time we talked? Uh, Boom. Segwayed. That's, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Are you going on one of those dates? Having more of those delicious no. dates? No. no, I've had people. I've had flakes. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> sure. What what flakery has occurred this week? I need make plan day of silence. <laughs> Try to make plans. Hit chat. Hit it up. Ghost. Try to talk. Block. Motherfucker. <laughs> that sucks i'm sorry it's it's balls it's a whole lot of bollocks like yeah i'm kind of going I also, I, I, things I, with eating too, and for so. the life of me i don't i don't understand i okay. don't understand for like if, you, if you're doing any kind of internet dating if you're doing anything like that a how hard is it to put anything in a profile so you look like an actual person B, if you're setting a thing that's like an <laughs> automatic conversation starter, why would you get irate when somebody actually responds to the question? Don't set it then. You don't have to do that. You oh, opted what, into What this. was the response? It, 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 like, you know, the, the question prompt is like, what's your dream dinner dinner like party guest or something? Yeah. I was like, I'd fucking want to kick it with Terry Crews. That sounds dope. Um everything I've seen of that man on screen and, like, on informal stuff, the guy seems awesome to hang out with. Yeah. So, you know, quick shout, go Terry Crews. Was it codified that you were responding to her? Yes! Okay. I, I, well, okay. It's, like, it, it's part of the chat log. It's yeah. like, what do, you, what do you fucking want? Like, why would you set that if you don't if you don't? And then they got, like, angry? It. It's just... I, I don't remember what the fuck. They said something and then just, like, blocked man I'm like what? <laughs> what was I supposed to do here maybe they were racist and you dodged a bullet I mean, it's possible that'd be really strange if it's a white person racist against other white people I've been over your choice of Terry Crews oh uh, mm, fair I guess Which case, she's like Ugh, race mixing I'm out <laughs> black people <laughs> um, um yeah um, so, no, there's, there's there's not a lot different other than just mild frustration and going from one depressing mentality to the next. Like, yeah, oh, balls. I, yeah, it's like, oh, I'm not. I think I finally realized, like, I'm not as as you know raked over the coals that Artemis has gone. Uh -huh. Good. Okay, moving moving forward. So what immediately settled in for the fucking de heading the helm with the depression is like, yeah, but you're alone now. And I'm like, God damn it. Like, <laughs> it fucking sucks. It's like, I trade one, get new, like, I traded arsenic for lead. Like, God fucking <laughs> Christ. <laughs> so. <sighs> that's very frustrating. So part next I've I've talked to my buddy in Oregon just to get the get the hell out of my apartment for a few days. I go hang out with him next weekend. Nice. Um, and and it mutually mutually beneficial because it's they are coming close to the end of uh, his wife dealing with chemotherapy. So in a good a, way or a bad way? Uh, pre pre planned. She, so this was supposed to be like a sixteen week program. They were going to do eight infusions. And so they're coming up on the eighth infusion. Okay. Uh, um, but it's just it's been very taxing couple of months. Yeah. So it does it does him some good. So you have. get to you get to uplift each other. 
Yeah, exactly. Awesome. That's great. So. Oh, so. I, I'm happy to hear at least that last bit. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Dating? Absolute dog shit. Wouldn't wish it on anybody. I hate that I'm still doing it. Yeah. Wee. Yeah. I am uh, jumping back into said pool recently. Uh, been trying. Dating apps suck. You either have to pay money, and I don't. I'm poor. I know I just won a bunch of money playing Magic, but I'm still very fucking poor. So I don't want to put money into a dating app when I think it's not likely to change the outcome. Mm -hmm. But also, then I have higher expectations. And so it's really weird. Luckily, I have accidentally matched with one person on Hinge who I am likely to meet up with this coming Friday. So next time we talk, maybe I'll have stories of fantastical or hopeful occurrences. I don't know. But like, and also they're fucking like two hours something away from me. So we have to like both drive an hour to meet up, which is fun. Uh, but yeah, like it's, it's crazy bad. Dating apps are the best worst thing. Or the worst best thing? Worst best thing. I think I, they I, are a net positive, but they are fucking. Mm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. I have mixed feelings. Like, well, okay. So on one hand, here's the way I see it. Sure. On one hand, like before dating apps, the way you dated was either through people you knew or fucking strangers. Literally and figuratively. So, it's just, for women especially, I think dating apps have to just be a net positive. You get to see, you get to talk to a person, you see their likes, dislikes on multiple apps. You don't have to get messaged unless you like their profile. There's a lot of, like, positive. You can also do it by where people live. You don't have to. Also, if you date somebody, one of the outcomes of the old way is you date somebody who you knew, or who, like, someone you knew knew. Yeah, it's like and someone, then it like goes to close in proximity. Yeah, yeah, close in proximity via friendship groups or just space, and then it goes badly. That infiltrates the rest of your life to some degree, because now yeah. you're like, uh, Ted got a little handsy, and it's like, okay, this is gonna be like really bad. Like, like well, this is awkward now. Yeah, or you know, he did this thing I didn't like, or whatever. It's like this is like awkward for everybody where. You get to expound, expound, expand, expand. shut up. I no. fixed it before you did. I, you get to expand your social sphere. You get to meet new people. You get to, if you're uncomfortable dating anybody in like a small town, you can find somebody else nearby, but not in your same town. You, there's a lot of good aspects about it. The fact that you do kind of get to treat people worse online is telling and also a shitty experience. The fact that people can ghost you, they can misrepresent themselves is also bad. But I think I think it is a net positive just the way the internet is a net positive overall. Like, bad things come up from it, but I think more good things come from it than bad. My stance, anyway. But I agree it is not... It is not as promising as we once were told. It's not very Jetson-like. So, I, I think that comes with some of the modernization of it. So... I, I have a rationale for this. Um, okay. And it's that I think part of the problem is that it's, and this has happened with a lot of things, and it's where it's, people have looked at it and said, okay, how can I make it print me money? Yeah. And so it's turned into, like, the idea of the attention economy. Yep. And so they are geared to keeping you as involved as possible by attention economy. And so with the promise of more possibility for engagement, they dangle it in front of you and say, you're more likely if you use our super swipes or whatever. Yeah. And they're like, oh, pay $2 for the privilege. And it's like, it's the nickel and dime for additional engagement. Well, in so. the case of like, we both use Bumble. In the case of Bumble, you have to pay to get like more than like 20 likes or 30 likes a day or whatever. Yeah. I mean, most most do some kind of arbitrary cap or something, um, yeah. Or they'll give you some kind of priority, or they like, they will give you some incentive and and perk. So, it's, um, and yeah. So, but I but we're both the the cheapo boys, so we do it for free. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Which is probably better for our eyeballs because then we can only do 30 a day. It's so we're somewhere between more eyeballs, selective. And... So you can't doom scroll as much. Exactly. So thanks, Bumble. You saved me. Uh, in other news, other than meeting someone who hopefully is cool, but could easily, I could. My fear is that I meet up with them and this is going to sound. They could harvest your kidneys. They could harvest my kidneys. That is, I think fear one is serial killer, psycho person. Fear two, this is probably, this is going to sound really uh, shallow, but is that they just like drastically don't meet. You know, they did took you, their pictures you very catfished a little bit. Catfished a bit. Yeah. And this is not to say that like, oh my God, you don't look like a picture, but like, Somewhere between that and, as I've learned through, like, going on half a decade of therapy, you need to not only be, like, mentally satiated by your counterpart, but you also need to be physically satiated in that, like, you need to find them attractive. If you don't find your partner attractive, you're gonna have fucking problems. Yep. And so, like, one could maybe argue that my, you know... Uh, if if one wanted to, they could maybe argue that like I'm setting the bar too high. I'm not even sure that's the case, but let's pretend that's true, valid. But like driving an hour, having talked with somebody, built up hopes and dreams, and then to meet them, and they're like, "You're gonna finish that salad?" You're like, "Ah, oh, Christ!" Yeah, I mean, like that's. I think people people assume, at least from my perspective, catfishing is if like you're just grossly misrepresenting who you're who you're going to be. I agree. So. Like, most people associate with, like, you know, a dude showing up instead of the girl you were promised. Like, you know. <laughs> promised. Yeah, like, you're, like my you wording, paid her my dad wording a is a little family. suspect there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Um, in other fun news, um, I have found a great. Uh, I think I've talked about this before. I have found a uh, great mechanic who I trust and love, which is great because my car got almost broken into again. <laughs> again? Yay, yay! Yeah. Jesus Christ. We're going two for two, baby. At least this time they didn't fuck up anything of major importance. They tried to break in via the passenger side and they just fucked up the door, which sucks, but it still opens from the inside, just not the outside. So now we ordered a part and have to wait for it to come here. It's like a couple hundred bucks to fix, which sucks. My, the reason I know I have found my fucking auto mechanic for life. Like I, I might not know who I'm going to go to bed with, but I know who I'm going to take my fucking car to for the rest of my live long days. <laughs> Cause I come there, he looks through stuff and his first reaction is God damn it. He goes, when I fix this, I want to put a sign on your car that says, if you're going to fucking try and steal it, you better fucking actually steal it. Don't half-ass steal this shit. We're tired of it. Sincerely, <laughs> mechanic. I'm like, yeah, I feel the same way. Just take my fucking car. Don't leave me with a problem. Just give me an insurance claim where I get something in return instead of a headache. Fucking Christ. Just listen. Listen listen to Shia and just do it. Do it. So... Yeah, that happened. It's gonna cost me some money, and right as so as of now, I don't have a door handle on my passenger side because they took off one part of it, and then the way at least the handle on Kia's work, or at least mine, is that it's a whole unit. So without all the pieces being there, if you just take the handle and slightly pull it back towards the rear of the car, mm -hmm. it just comes off like easy. It was like chunk. I did, like no effort. Just pop. Just popped right off. I was like, oh, okay. And now, so in my driver, in my fucking console, I just have a fucking handle. <laughs> just chilling there. Just, just cause. Just cause. But uh, yeah, that's basically what's been going on this week for me. Just fun, fun, fun. <laughs> Promises and expectations. And just like my week is full of promises and expectations, this week's episode is full of the opposite of that. What do we got for him, Bros Kinkowski? <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about some, some fancy dancy rug pulls or kind of big twists. The things where 
if you go back and look at it, maybe you could have seen it coming. It recontextualizes everything moving forward from that plot point. And uh, there's some that are awesome. And they're, they're a great dramatic reveal. It's a, it's a great oh shit moment from the audience. A big <gasps> kind of revelation. And so uh, we'd, we'd like to appreciate some of those and give our thoughts for why we think they are awesome and stand out. And needless to say, but we'll say it anyway, moving forward, there are full of spoilers. spoilers. Most of these come at the cost, most of these come towards the end of a movie or show or whatever. And um, they they kind of, sp- we're spoiling the surprise. There's just, there's no, we're, we're taking away all the buildup. Sorry. Deal with it. That being said, there was a study put out by like, like Harvard or something like that that when movies are spoiled and you go back and watch them, if you hadn't watched them once, it actually, in a lot of cases, enhanced the viewing process. So if you want to try that experiment out in real time, feel free to listen to this episode. If you haven't seen these, we're good. We will say the uh, part of each, say each one first and then get into it. So if you're listening, I don't know how to skip ahead in a profitable manner in that regard, but. I guess we can say the movies that we're going to talk about. Sure. We can just give a quick quick run. Yeah, in order, it's going to be Memento. Perfect Blue. Primal Fear. Promise Neverland. Tully. Wisdom of Crowds. Old Boy. Seven. Scream! Identity. Wreck it, Ralph. Coco. The Prestige. The Descent. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking finally did one. <laughs> the usual suspects. Fight Club. Get out! And Game of Thrones. Alright, so starting in order, we've got Memento. Memento was actually Christopher Nolan's first fucking movie, and it's a banger. Comes out hard and fast. So, Wait. No, it isn't. It's not? It's not. I I only uh the I think it's following is Christopher Nolan's first movie. Really? Yes. I only know this because of Brooklyn Nine Nine. <laughs> Hold on. Show me his filmography. Oh, you're totally right. Following. Yeah. So I I know this because of Brooklyn Nine Nine. He Jake is just baffled that. Pimento hasn't seen the movie Memento, and he's like, Christopher Nolan's first movie, because Jake, following was Christopher Nolan's first movie. You're looking like a grade-A jackass out here. <laughs> That's the only reason I know that. Sorry, proceed. All right, well, touche. It's the second movie. Uh, damn. Got, got. So, Memento, Christopher Nolan's second movie, is a banger. Um, it is... Uh, led by Guy Pierce, and has a lot of other hitters in the cast. It plays with time very, very well, which is fantastic. And it does this really good switch where, so the main gimmick of the movie is there are 10 minute vignettes where the character remembers things. So you're going through the main character's POV, who has medium term memory loss, I guess. You're, like, he, he's in Terrigrade Amnesia. Say again? He is in Terrigrade Amnesia. He has no short term memory. Interrograde amnesia? Yep. Okay. So, that. And he lives in 10-minute snippets, and to remember things, it's weird that this works, but he tattoos things on his body as, like, a permanent sticky note, so he can't forget them. Only problem is, he other people know about this, and one of them uses it to their own ends, so the whole entire movie, he's looking for his wife's killer. Hmm. The problem is, he doesn't realize that he's the one that killed his wife. And so he's looking for somebody that doesn't exist and ends up killing his partner because of corruption and this person who kind of twists him around their finger. Hmm. Fantastically shot. It doesn't... You don't think that's where it's going. You think it's just a good thriller. And the best part, and I think a lot of these... The reason they work is because if the twist wasn't there, the movie would operate well to good to maybe even great. And then with the twist, 
it is like a mega Just, cherry on top. I'd say it adds adds a little extra little extra punch. I, yeah. For a lot of these, I think the reason we're talking about them is because it adds all the punch. But without them, they would still function. So it yeah, went I'm, from good to great. I mean, great that's to that's what I mean. Is back. they're not essential. Like they are good. They have yeah. value added, but they are not required. Yeah, I think they are agreed. They are not required, but I think they are essential to their greatness. But I don't think they are essential to their goodness necessarily. Yeah. They they are what makes them stand out and be more unique. But they're, they are not. Like, but they would be a serviceable movie without it. Yeah, they're like what you like in video games. They are a critical hit multiplier. All right, all right. I'll I'll work with this. Okay. Well, as I've said, all that there needs to be said because I don't know. Go watch Memento. It still bangs, even though I knew that going into the movie. A shocking amount of these I knew going into watching them oddly, mm. uh, and that one still slaps knowing that's the ending because it's kind of an interesting piecing together and just along for this weird puzzle ride. So mm. uh, yeah, check out Memento. All right, next up, uh, Perfect Blue is a it's fairly old at this point. I think I'm on like ninety five. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is a. It is a show about someone going into the J-pop industry, or a movie about them going to the J-pop industry and being super stressed and over overworked and losing their shit. And there is a lot of the movie that starts to toy with you don't know what starts to be hallucination versus what is reality, mm-hmm. because she keeps seeing kind of a representation of who she thinks she should be, and. The final scene shows that somebody has actually been fucking with her, and it's kind of her friend who has Ugh. lost her mind with jealousy. It's it's kind of a brutal reveal, because then her friend wants to kill her and take her place. Sheesh! Yeah, and so the fun thing is, with this movie, you can actually go back and track and kind of go, what's real? What is her losing it? Mm-hmm. And see see kind of through some of the curtain with with context it's really well done and it's it makes for such an awesome kind of climactic scene all right so next up we have the actual first major motion picture that Edward Sorry. Martin was involved in and he comes off with his fucking gloves laced Primal Fear is a courtroom drama with Richard Gere and hold on one second. I want to get the other person right. Laura Linney. That's who I thought it was. Cool. So you've got Richard Gere, Laura Linney, Edward Norton, John Mahoney from uh, Frasier, and Francis McDormand, and hey, Andrew Brower from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Oh. Uh-huh. Nope. And right. uh, Terry O'Quinn from Lost. But the show stealer is Edward Norton, who is the plaintiff in the case where, or, sorry, not plaintiff, um, the opposite, whatever. They are being taken to court for the murder of a priest, and they are pleading, initially they are pleading that the priest did messed up stuff, and then they plead, plead insanity, as mm-hmm. early on in the case, Richard Gere discovers that... Edward Norton's character has an alter ego or like a, he has a split personality disorder okay. when they're talking. Cause initially when you are introduced to Edward Norton's character in primal fear, he's this kind of stuttering Southern boy who's scared and I didn't do it. I, oh, well, why? Oh, no. It, oh, and yeah. then I don't quite remember quite what the circumstance is. I think he's Richard Gere is annoyed at his client for like leaving something out and he goes to leave the room. And it's fucking awesome. Edward Norton's hmm. character stands up, looks at him, and you can see it in his face before he says a word. It's like slightly off and to the right. Mm-hmm. He stands up, he goes, where the fuck you think you're going, boy? It's just like, I'm sorry, what? And it's just like the whole room and my skin freezes. It's like, huh? <laughs> uh, beg, beg your pardon? And then it's revealed that, you know, got this alter ego. Okay, we go through with it. The alter ego comes out <laughs> and nearly tries to kill fucking... Laura Linney's character in court. It's fucking awesome. Then at the end, the very end, big spoiler alert, 
they they get him off the charges they're like yo you're like you're free to go you know and he's trying to figure it out and he leaves and he goes and like they're, they're talking you know the 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 um verdict has come in he's free and he's talking with richard gear mm. and he goes I, this is something that just doesn't add up to Richard Gere and talking to him, he goes, Oh, I thought you understood, Counselor. There was never any Andy. The reality is that the alter ego wasn't suppressed. It was the first character you meet. It was a fabrication. He is oh. this psycho so the, killer the mild mannered was the projection yeah the, this kind of oh fake. gosh and uh it's like yeah. yep just completely made up and he goes there was never any aaron it's just like richard Gere's face at that moment was like my face like what the fuck oh <laughs> it's God. like we just helped a serial killer <laughs> it's like yeah and like the best part is he like he like he's still a kid he's like i thought you knew i thought this was like a fun game for us and richard Gere's like <laughs> she like runs out of room with like terror on his face oh my god it's fucking epic and that was his first like major motion picture he pulls off this thing that i believe it got him an oscar nod and then the rest is history so next up is i, I the first episode of promise neverland does some shit to you um it's it starts very peculiar and you know something is a bit strange it's like this kind of orphanage in the countryside and they have these it seems kind of normal and on the up and up except they do these weird like intelligence tests and it they're the the lady taking care of the house is weirdly hovery over certain people and it's just a little off okay. right and it's like, this, this feels strange. I can't put my finger on it. It feels wrong. So the mayor at. Look, one, of the, one of the little girls gets to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and so she go and she forgets like her teddy bear. And so one, one of the, the orphans who's kind of like the big sister for everybody goes, oh, I have to take this to her. And so there's, they're supposed to be picked up at the gate. And it's a little strange that like, you know, the, the new parents adopting aren't going to come in and just, you know, pick them up from the orphanage. It's weird walking out to the outer gate, which is way the fuck out there. Okay, fine. So run out, teddy bear. Got to give it, got to give it to like Rebecca or something. I forget her name. Okay. They get there and there's a car idling and they open the back seat. Rebecca's dead as fuck. <laughs> Rebecca has like had her chest ripped open. Sheesh. Yeah. So, and so these two kids who ran out to give her the teddy bear panic and hide as this massive monstrosity comes lumbering in and takes this girl's body out of the car and shambles away with it. Turns out the orphanage is effectively, <laughs> is effectively a race. It's like a farm for humans. Yeah, the kids don't leave because they're not allowed to. They're like livestock. Mm -hmm. Surprise! <laughs> and the reason they're given IQ tests are like regular intelligence checks. The kids who are not developing appropriately get fed out early, but the ones who are maturing properly, they let them live longer, so they get bigger, so there's more of them to eat, because apparently being smarter makes your brain tastier. So that is why the main characters are the oldest kids. They're the smartest. That's why they've been allowed to live. Wee! <laughs> oh man, I'm scared. Yeah, that is that is a big bombshell to just bitch slap you with at minute ten of episode one. Oh god damn, they get into it early. Oh yeah. I mean, because the rest of season one is them trying to escape the orphanage. Cause uh they don't want to get eaten. So, fun! <laughs> <laughs> we still don't talk about season two. It doesn't exist. It doesn't know. exist. Not real. Can't hurt us. Yeah. So, the movie Tully was billed as this, and is, 
a fantastical uh, movie about having a kid, about what okay. it's like to have a kid and going through that process. It follows. Um, Show notes. Charlie's Theron. She's just had a kid. She's going through a tough time. She has some loving family members who want to help them out and like get them a nanny. Initially, they disagree and like they're like, no, I can do this on my own. And then this nanny shows up and starts to help her. And it's much to Charlie's Theron's betterment she's feeling better enjoying better having better relationships with her husband ron livingston this is great and she even starts to become good friends and go on like little jaunts with her baby and their new uh, uh mate not mate uh wet nurse i guess i don't know uh mm-hmm. that like can help her out and it's great it's very lovely it's betterment you know it's doing a lot of good things and then it comes out at the very end that they go on this trip i don't remember if she gets in an accident or kind of passes out while driving and just like runs into like a guardrail or something like that it's not anything hmm. disastrous yeah. but it comes to reality that tully is a figment of her imagination and that she projected this person into existence as like a coping mechanism. Mm-hmm. And that she's been doing all of this under the guise of this other person. And so she's been kind of in a way was like, okay, what would a maid do? Okay, I'm going to do all that as me as a way to cope with all the stress. Because she's mm-hmm. already got two kids and then has like a third kid. And so it's like exhausting, really bad. And then she does this to cope and fix it, and it does work, but the problem is she isn't sleeping. That she Hmm. is, like, kind of gaslit herself into manifesting this other person's existence in her head and doing all that they would do. So she's living two lives and getting, you know, half as much sleep. Yeah. I think there's, like, a term or a symptom for something akin to this effect. Obviously, most people don't see an other person. But... It's a gr- it was a great realization and great manifestation of how to show um, just how hard it is to be a parent, I guess. Mm-hmm. And yeah, big fan. I think it does a great job of showcasing what it's like to, you know, be a parent and have to go through all that. So I thought it was a somewhere between a great love letter and also a great rug pull. Yeah. I'd... the the sweetest one on the list by a lot yeah by so, by a ton <laughs> enjoy that for a moment moms <laughs> let, it, let it sit in it enjoy it okay because we're i'm taking this rapidly downhill yep um so the uh Wis- wisdom of crowds is the third book in the um the most recent trilogy by joe abercrombie um and the wisdom of crowds is a mess of a novel and not not like the writing is poor but the the novel starts off with a massive large-scale insurrection um so the whole idea is the there keeps being whispers about the great change because effectively like the industrial revolution where workers rights are not present and what is this living wage you speak of Mm -hmm. and what do you mean you haven't eaten in two days? Um, so people hate it for good reasons. And someone pulls the strings to make it happen and mobilize tens of thousands of commoners who just kind of walk into the capital and take it over. Except that it's kind of a disaster because it turns out a huge revolution like that is good for about an hour. And then you have to think about logistics and feeding that many people Uh and so many other things that make government run and make countries run and X, Y, Z. Okay. Except something keeps kind of tugging at the background 
Like it's organized. It turns out the guy who's doing it did it deliberately. He wrecked the company on purpose, or he wrecked the country on purpose. Because he won he wanted to make it effectively financially free. He did it to destroy this huge banking institution that effectively owned the whole country. Because he was tired of being under the thumb of uh, Bias, who, through use of money, owned the crown. He owned yeah. the he owned the banks, which owned the crown, which owned the the companies, which owned the everything. But when everything is burned down, yeah, you can't cash out a loan. <laughs> so he, and so it's revealed at the right. end he organized it. He basically burned a country down to liberate it. What? <laughs> yeah, it's... And the whole time, you think he leaves, because he's like... He was, he, he was effectively the royal torturer. He ran the Inquisition. Mm-hmm. So he just kind of goes, Revolution? I'm out. Like, Revolution. they're going to want my head on a stick. I'm hiding in the country. And so you just assume he leaves. Yeah. And he shows up at the end, and he's the one pulling the fucking strings. It, hell of a fucking poll. What's next? So next up we got Old Boy, and you should watch this anyway you like, because it's a great fucking movie. It's a banger of all time. But I'm gonna ruin the ending, so sorry, it's your fault. You should watch it by now. Should have. So Old Boy is this South Korean masterpiece, very fucked up. Movie starts off with this guy going and buying a gift for his either just born or very young daughter and then gets napped and just gets scooped up left right off like, the road. He's in like a phone booth. So, yeah, it's just like I think he's calling home to say he's going to be there in a minute or something. And yeah. there's just and it's just like his friend turns around and the like the phone's empty or whatever. Yeah. He gets put in a ho like a like imprisoned in a hotel, fed through the bottom of the door kind of thing for years on end. He is not sure how long it is. And then mysteriously, after a set amount of time, without any particular interrogation or anything like that, he is then released back into the world. Like dropped in a suitcase, if memory serves. Like he wakes up in a park inside of a suitcase. <laughs> yeah, he's he's like a big fucking trunk. Yeah, yeah I just pops open he's like the fuck which is iconic as hell uh goes around finds a place where he can stay there is this young woman who runs the place and she's like kind of confused that he came to be but is you know nice and helpful about it and he's going around trying to figure out what the fuck happened who did this to him what the fuck's going on so he's Mm -hmm. going this old boy if you will but um is going around (laughs) the streets of like i don't think it's soul but let's say it's soul with a fucking hammer because ni- like knives are dangerous and like precarious and guns are illegal as hell. So he's going around with this like fucking uh what are they called? What are the ones with the thing on the back? Rock like claw hammer. Say again? Uh claw hammer. Claw he's going around the streets of soul with a claw hammer, looking for justice and information. Ending up in one of the coolest, like, fucking alley fights you'll ever see on his in, like, televised history. It's fucking red as hell. It is a dope fucking prolonged shot fight. So, the rug pull is that the reason this happened is because somebody he went to, like, school with, one day after school, he was just hanging around, being a, like, degenerate or whatever. Or delinquent, that's what I was looking for. Just kind of, like, fucking about school comes across this guy making out with his sister and this like incestuous relationship. I don't remember if he says anything about it. He probably does. And that causes the girl to commit suicide out of like embarrassment. So the brother and lover of his own sister takes it upon himself to avenge her by fucking with this guy. So Mm -hmm. he has gone out, you know, messed up this guy's life fucked him up mentally, you know, held him in a hotel room for like close to a decade. And on top of that, went to 
bizarre lengths to encourage sexual congress between the guy that's been released and the young landlady that was like putting him up in a room to rent, which he then later finds out yeah, is his own stuff. daughter. Boom. Got him. Wow. And, bizarre yeah. great lengths. Yeah. Went to insane lengths to avenge for doing something illegal. Couldn't, couldn't you just throw him off a roof? Like... Yeah. <laughs> right? No, he needed to experience the same thing and then hate himself for some bullshit. I don't know. It, it's fucking awesome. It's You never see it coming. It's so great. Now you'll see it coming. I hope it's still great. All right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit with a, a classic. So we got to throw some Fincher in here. At least once. At least once. Um, and what's in the box? <laughs> um, what's in the fucking box? Yeah, the the end of seven is such such a good scene. Um, just everything about it, and the from the the kind of unknown and the I don't even. I think you eventually get to see that. Do you ever get to see that it's actually her head, or you just like see that top of it, like the hair, right? I don't even think you see that. Okay. Um. The the tense the tension between Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt as he's trying to talk down Brad Pitt and just Kevin Spacey being absolutely cold blooded and unconcerned. Honestly, which is probably the most unsettling part of it, is he is just so calm. He yeah. is uncomfortably calm, given how tense the rest of the scene is around him. Yeah, he's just like, yeah, sure. He's just, I got jealous, so I took her head. <laughs> and she, and the, he just told you. <laughs> yeah. And the the other twist that he is expecting to die, and that he has it all mapped out. And he is ready to die there because he is the last. He is the last crime. He is the last person to die. He's wrath. It's so good. And just, it's it's kind of interesting too because it's and Morgan Freeman even says it when Kevin Spacey turns himself in because he's not done. There should be two more of these. It's like yes, you haven't found them yet. <laughs> They're waiting for you. It's just such a such a good turn on its head. Yeah, yeah. It just everything about that scene is so money. Honestly, everything about that movie is so money. The start is a little bit slow, but otherwise, fucking phenomenal film. Still holds up, I'd argue. Yeah, I, I choose to not think about Kevin Spacey being a fucking weirdo at this point, but. Because his acting... Art from the artist. I mean, yeah, art from know. the artist. Performance, still terrific. Yep. We'll, we'll give it where it's due. Speaking mm -hmm. of performances that were amazing, Scream is oddly great for a movie that is so meta and self-referential. Scream was made in like the late 90s, early 2000s. No, it must have been late 90s, right? I think it's late 90s. I think it's like 96. Yeah, and it was a almost a parody of the slasher genre by one of the people that invented it in um. What the fuck was it? I was da, right. Da, da. It is nineteen ninety six. It was late nineteen ninety six. Yeah, nineteen ninety six. It was directed by Wes Craven, who is arguably one of the people that invented the slasher genre, and he decided to not as a scathing indictment, but as somewhere between a love letter and kind of tongue in cheek tongue-in-cheek kind of toying with it made the movie scream scream yeah. does it is very much kind of the without scream you don't have cabin in the woods of this you know playing with the art form while still being the art form yeah scream is a good horror movie while still making fun of horror movies which is an amazing tour de force and nothing more emblematic of that is the intro where the movie is predominantly people that you kind of knew from tv or maybe they had done a movie recently that was kind of cool but they weren't names except for drew barrymore america's favorite girl 
is like headlining this movie. You're like, okay, it's, you know, Drew's going to be the heroine. Got it. And then in the first 10 minutes, they fucking kill her brutally. Yeah, no. No holds barred. No. Girl gets mopped and quick. The movie yeah. does not waste any time. You've got the boyfriend tied to a chair and then disemboweled. You've got fucking the scary as fuck phone call. And then you have one of the more troublesome deaths for me of puncturing someone's lung so they can't cry out for help to then string them up and showcase them in front of their parents. God damn. The first 10 minutes and it's the only name in the movie. Wes Craven motherfucking knew what he was doing. R.I.P. Goat Man. Sheesh! Yeah, he absolutely rolled the whole audience. I think you're watching her movie. Nah. You're watching my movie. Speaking of rolling the whole audience, um, movie Identity has a very interesting kind of callback and absolute turn at the table. So the movie actually starts with people being like called out of like I think it's a lawyer and a detective being called out of bed to go to an interrogation. And then it cuts to a bunch of people who end up at a motel. And it's on this night where it's flash flooding and they can't leave and so they're just stuck at this rinky dink motel. The roads are all flooded. People gotta stay put. Okay. And it goes from that into this absolute debacle where people are just kind of dying because someone stole a set of keys. So they're not sure who they can trust. There's a limited number of people there. And you're just watching people get narked left, right, and center, trying to figure out, okay, who is who is the killer as the characters are trying to figure out who they can actually trust. It's basically turning into a fucking game of Among Us. Um... Except then it pans back to the people at the start. This has all been a psychological test, or a psychological, effectively, routine. Where they are trying to suss out the murderous personality in a guy with dissociative identity disorder, and see if they can effectively cure him to rehabilitate him. So they are trying to simulate putting all his... Uh, personalities in a confined space to see which one ends up withstanding. The people you're watching die are his personalities being axed while they're trying to solve for effectively which one is the murderous one and can we get rid of it to save the rest. So fucking crazy. It is, it is a really bizarre switch. And um I'm not, I'm not going to tell you if they find it. <laughs> Let's go to something a little more wholesome. What do you got? Yeah, I guess this one's not too bad as it is, like, G-rated. And Wreck-It Ralph. And Wreck-It Ralph. And Wreck-It Wreck Ralph. <laughs> Wreck-It Ralph. And Wreck-It Ralph. We have been told about, at the beginning of this movie, what happens You're when... you going turbo, are you? When you go turbo. Or when you go into somebody else's game or kind of ruin your own game. And what the worrisome and possible outcomes are. To then, in the end of the movie, we find out that what happened to Turbo. And that he's still in the system. We find out who the real bad guy is. When it is revealed that this guy... Who was an antagonist, to be sure, but understandably so. It was a character that was inside a game, and you thought maybe, and again, reasons why these work alone, is if the character of King Candy is the bad guy, but he is a bad guy from his own universe who doesn't like what this one character is doing, it makes sense. It's kind yeah. of like one of those outsiders looking in, and that going turbo was this thing to be worried about, but not necessarily something that was the movie was going to be about. And these yeah. would all work. This would work mm -hmm. just fine. But it works even better when you just, if we find him again. We still got Turbo. Yeah. What if we went Turbo? Yeah. And the movie does, and it ends amazingly. 
and it is revealed in the last possible minute with some but very little pretense and it makes it all the more sweet and shocking it's voiced by alan tudyk right yeah it's just him being manic as shit and i love it that guy's voice does manic so damn well too yeah he's he's busted uh sticking with the family animation coco um I, yet another example of Pixar waging unrepentant war on your emotion. Um, Coco has such an interesting change in dynamic in a couple of ways. The first is that you learn the musical idol of the big character. That fucker's a fraud! <laughs> <laughs> like, straight up. And you get, especially because the, I mean, the first ghost is like, oh, I taught him how to play. Yeah. I taught Ernesto. Is his name Ernesto? Yeah, I think so. And he's like, I taught him how to play. And you're just like, okay, he's, you know, he's just, he's just fucking blind. No, no, no. He's being actually serious. He's unironically, he wrote the songs. He legit is why that guy is. Yeah. Yeah. Ernesto de la Cruz. There we go. Um, Man, good job. Good job, Brain. I didn't have to look it up. Um, <laughs> like, he is why Ernesto de la Cruz is this glor- this venerated, revered, you know, musician. And then that he only gets to be that because he killed him. Because he killed him. He poisoned him. Yep. And everyone who assumed he just had this laughable death of, like, basically food poisoning. Nah, he was actually poisoned. Oh, also, that's your great-grandfather. <laughs> Shuts up. <laughs> yeah, surprise. Like this kind of seemingly nobody you ran into. Yeah. Who just happened to be like kind of an a forced tour guide. No, he's your relative. <laughs> he's he is the missing link that your family has has not wanted to talk about because they didn't know why he abandoned them. He never meant to. Which then leads to the horrendously tearful like, a gut-wrenching scene of him trying to get Coco to remember her father before she dies. So she can tell other people about him. Mm-hmm. Such a good scene. God, I don't like how, I don't like that I have goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, allow me to take away that feeling from Please you. Please do. The Prestige is yet... Wait, hold on. Is this another Christopher Nolan movie? It might be. <laughs> it totally is! Motherfucker got us again! Ah! So The Prestige is a fantastic take on the kind of illusionist genre. You know, the the kind of magician experience. In a way, we have the fantastical Christian Bale opposite the amazing Hugh Jackman. Both of which are illusionists in their own right, and they work together under some other guy. After uh, Hugh Jackman's wife dies in a trick, I think it's Rebecca Hall. Wait, hold on. I don't remember who it is. Uh, she dies in a trick, and Hugh Jackman blames Christian Bale. Christian Bale's like, so the they're supposed to do true a trick one way. Hugh Jackman's wife wants to do it another way, and Christian Bale is like game for it even though the master says not to, and Hugh Jackman's a little tentative. After the trick goes awry, Hugh Jackman's wife dies. Hugh Jackman asks Christian Bale, hey, did you do this or did you do that? And he goes, I don't remember. Hold on to that. It's going to be important. It's going to be important. He gets angry as obvious, you know, wife died and kind of seemingly glib response. You know, what the fuck? And then they become arch rivals and they both try to outdo each other in magicianship, you know, do the bigger trick. They're the two big wigs in town. They're doing these great tricks. And occasionally they just literally fuck with each other. Like at one point, I think Christian Bale is doing this cool trick and Hugh Jackman shows up. And I, I think it's like. I think it's something to do with like getting shot at or something like that. And Hugh Jackman mm. just shows up with a real gun and tries to shoot Christian Bale's character. <laughs> Or something to that effect. Anyway, it goes back and forth. There's some interference with each other. 
and then they just start trying to do bigger and bigger tricks. Mm -hmm. At one point, they try to do... Uh, Christian Bale is able to do this trick where he... There's two doors on a stage and he walks through one of them, closes it, he seemingly disappears, and then walks through the other even though there isn't a way like it, it looks like he's you know kind of like almost like teleporting like eight feet across the stage yeah. and you're like wow how is this possible how can he possibly do this, this is so amazing so Hugh Jackman can't figure it out and then I don't remember if it's advice via Michael Caine or just random serendipity but he just goes out and finds a body double replicates huh. Christian Bale's trick Christian Bale gets angry with him comes intoxicates his extra and ties him up and then kind of makes him look like a dipshit on his stage, you know, kind of like outing him for like cheating huh. of, of a sense. Christian Bale the, or uh, Hugh Jackman then to outdo him goes and finds Nikola Tesla played by David Bowie. Yes, really. Excellent. And it's fucking awesome. I believe my understanding of it is that Christopher Nolan wrote the part for Bowie. Bowie was like, I don't know about this. And then like they had lunch or they, there was something that just like put him over the edge. I don't remember if he like told him about the movie or something like that, but he was just like, I'm in. <laughs> it was fucking <laughs> awesome. Uh, that, or it might've been inverted where David Bowie wanted in. He's like, yeah, I'll write you a part, David Bowie <laughs> and wrote him a part as Tesla. <laughs> I don't remember which, but it's adorable. Look up the reasoning. If I can't find it, if I can't find it, I'll obviously be in show. Uh, but uh okay so after that happens he goes and finds him and they're able to create this machine that replicates things initially it's just replicating top hats okay. and like bunny rabbits but then through his need to outdo uh uh christian bale's character hugh jackman tries it on himself and is able to make a copy of himself Hmm. And that's he that's how he like perfects the trick. And he's able to do it in this way that is irrepeatable. Um also through this becomes a lot more affluent and pays off people and gets uh Christian Bale's character arrested and put in prison for this thing, for the, the death of his wife forever many years ago. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the movie ends with um him Christian Bale gets hung hanged whatever the tech correct one is and his confidant and good friend who's kind of been sitting in the background the whole entire time takes care of his daughter and then after like after uh Hugh Jackman does his trick and I think he's like leaving or cleaning up shop. He runs into the other or like the kind of uh, confidant of Christian Bale's character. Yeah. Who pulls out a gun and shoots him. And you're like, oh, dude, what the fuck? You know, get it even for the boss, man. Then he takes off his attire and it's fucking Christian Bale. It's like, <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, my God. You know, did he teleport? Did, did he actually know magic? Yada, yada. Nope. They were fucking twins. So the reason he was able to do the trick in the first place of the doors that Christian, that, uh, sorry, Hugh Jackman wanted to copy is because he just had his twin do it. He would walk in one and they had a trap door and he would walk out the other. And that's how he was able to do it. And that's how he didn't know if he tied the knot or not is because it wasn't him that was doing the trick that night. It was his other half. And he doesn't know if he tied the knot or not. Hmm. And it goes into this whole idea. Uh, so one of the other kind of cool reveals is that Hugh Jackman's character, when he makes the copy, he doesn't know if it's going to be him. So the, to not have infinite, clones ring on the round in the world they just kill the clone that gets made from the machine 
The only issue is sometimes it would be Hugh Jackman. Sometimes it would teleport him and make the clone where he was standing. And sometimes it would make the clone across from him. And so he is like sort of died like a thousand times perfecting and accomplishing this trick. I'm not going to lie. It now makes so much more sense in the show Brick and Morty when he says, yeah, I prestiged you. (laughs) Yeah. So... Movie's awesome. Ending's amazing. Highly recommend. Oh my god, that is hard to juggle without context. Uh, Sorry. It's all good. Uh, The Descent has a phenomenal upheaval to it. Oh, Um, yes. So, the the whole premise is there's a bunch bunch of people, they like doing spelunking, and there is... um, a lady who is they they get a trip because one of their their friends recently lost her husband and her kid in a car crash. So hey, you know, let's let's go out. Be good, be good time. And they're expecting to go out to this uh, you know easy easy cave system. It's pretty common. Okay. Well, they somebody's all right. We're gonna go here. Leads them to some place that is uncharted. It is. It is not a known fucking cave system at all. Oh, well, that's fucking helpful. Um, <laughs> as they go, they nearly like they they're squeezing through stuff that you probably shouldn't go through. And part of it collapses behind them. So they don't have an easy way out. Oh, and there's things down there um, in a terrific uh, directorial change or er, kind of kind of fuckery. They have somebody in like the makeup and prosthetics for these humanoid cannibal things that are hunting down there. And they did not prep the actors or the actresses. So they walk in and shine a flashlight over him and their screams of surprise are legit because there is someone who looks like a fucking goblin just in front of them. (laughs) Yeah. It's so fucking awesome, and it, like, does bring up moral dilemmas of how to treat your actors on set. Yeah. What? Um. Yeah, and there is, what I got, apparently, there are, there is a second release, or there, there was a change in the end of the movie, and about a one minute change, I really don't know why they did it, um, where... Everybody is dying in this film. Except the main character. She gets out. She she manages to climb up this, like, mountain of skulls and, like, bones and shit. And claw her way out of this cave system. And sprints out, sprints to her car, drives the fuck away. Vomits on the side of the road. Uh, just coated in blood, That's gore. Okay. She is a mess. And then she she comes back too. She's still in the cave. She didn't make it out. She's looking at a younger version of herself presenting her. No, she's looking at her kid. she's looking at her kid. Oh she that's her kid, okay. That's her kid. And she's looking at her kid who's bringing her a cake. And so she just gives up and she breaks because she is she is overdone. As you hear uh, a bunch of the cave dwellers like basically coming for her yep. to eat her. Yay! <laughs> so depressing. What's what's next? Well, far, while far less nefarious, the ending of the usual suspects is one of those that has to make the list. Of course, it is. Another great performance by Kevin Spacey, the monster that we used to think was cool. Yeah. In this movie, you have uh, Gabriel Byrne, um, Jeffrey Pollock, uh, Kevin Spacey, um, one of the, uh, not Alec, but like one of the other Baldwins, and Benicio Del Toro, amongst other bangers. And there are these hired group of mercs to do a job job ends up going sideways and then sideways again they think something hinky's happened and there's whisperings of this 
uh, Kaiser Soze, who is supposed to be like the ultimate badass mob boss motherfucker. The end of the movie, or the beginning of the movie, the whole entire movie is told from one person's perspective, and that is this kind of gimp, slow walking character played masterfully by Kevin Spacey. And he's talking about how this all went down, telling the cops for immunity, you know, yeah, this is what happened and couldn't help you more. I wasn't there for this or that. And he's, you know, it's kind of a little talks a little slow. He's got like this bum leg drag. And mm -hmm. then at the end of the movie, he's let go. You know, they, they, they're, they're questioning him because a bunch of his cohorts that he had previously been attached with in the files had died on this colossal goat fuck on a fucking harbor freight where a shootout of epic mafia proportions took place. They're asking yeah. about this. What'd you see? Where were you? What happened? Cause they think something hinkies at play. Maybe even the, you know, terrifying Kaiser. So it was somehow involved. His information is sparse and he's released to go. Then at the end, as he walks out, it starts to unravel all those things that he was told throughout the meeting, he looks around and he sees that Kevin Spacey used a lot of just like wall clippings as noun fill-ins for this mad lib of an explanation. It's all coming together. This He's presented with a new couple pieces of information that makes it likely, in fact, even probable that Kevin Spacey is Kaiser Soze. As all of this takes place, you get to see it from a fantastical perspective of him Kevin Spacey walking out of the building, going slow limp, slow limp, changing to walk, changing to fast canted pace as he lights a cigarette and gets in like a very awesome looking town car. Bum, bum, wah! And got to have another entry here from our, our main man, Fincher. Oh, this is our gritty aesthetic. We get another entry by Fincher and another entry by Edward Norton. <laughs> yep. Although she's here. on the other foot as far as an art is concerned, I suppose. Um, Fight Club. Hey, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about it. It's the first two rules. Um, and the the reveal at the end where so, for so long you don't know what Edward Norton's name is. At the end, you don't actually know what his name is. His name is Tyler Durden. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Look at the IMDb credits. It's not Tyler Durden. No, okay, okay, okay. Yes, he, he is, like, as far as the listing, yes, he's not listed as Tyler Durden. The character, like, in world, the character's name is Tyler Durden. Yeah, sure. And that is literally what everyone calls him. Or that, that is what he is called. When he, when he finally asks Mara, like, what is my name? I mean, one could argue that that's the name he chose for himself after he went through, like, the mental break and made a second personality, too. But Sure. Anyway. I, but either way, that is that is the name we are given. Either way, the identity of Tyler Durden, the identity that Brad Pitt is, is fake. It is <laughs> the, the kind of anarchist, nefarious version of Tully. Where yeah. he's, <laughs> yeah, where he's Edward Norton is this mild mannered fucking office stooge. He works on a cubicle. It's dog shit. He hates it, and so he just goes wild with an idea. What if he wasn't? So he imagines the best version of himself, who is fearless and confident and uncompromising, and 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 he is the best a guy can be, and he just runs with it. And it's so divorced from how he normally would behave that he has to imagine it as something else. And it just kind of takes over his life. And it pushes him when he thinks he's asleep. He's doing things. He's staying up and making soap or setting his apartment on fire. <laughs> um, and it's such a cool reveal when he finally realizes that he's chasing himself. And that just Brad Pitt isn't real. He's just his imaginary friend. And even if he's a, even that he's still an antagonist, even though that Edward Norton is aware that it's his imaginary friend, it still has that much power over him. 
<laughs> you were shooting a gun at your imaginary friend. You're 400 gallons of nitro. <laughs> All right. Final stretch. What do you got? Get out. Don't even take a fucking bagel. No. So the movie Get Out is the first, I guess, horror thriller film, because he did technically did Keanu, I think, before this, of, um, uh, well, uh, Jordan Peele, sorry. I thought Key and Peele, and then I went to Kegel, Mike, and Key, and then I was like, no, that's not it. So Jordan Peele, the now becoming amazing horror and thriller director, created Get Out in the, was it late 2000, or like 2010s? I think. I think uh, maybe like 2016 or something. Yeah. I right, mid 2010s. So he goes might, about making it might, this. It might have been later. I don't know. I can check. I'll check. So Get Out focuses around. 2017. 2017. Uh, who's the lead actor? Is it David Kaluuya? Is that his name? I think so. Yeah. Or Daniel Kaluuya. Anyway, Kaluuya is this uh, African American college student has a white girlfriend and is going to have that awkward, you know, going to finally the meet parents. Meet the parents, which is a has been the name of at least two films. Of one of which was actually good. So they, dude, the other one has Ash and Kutcher and Bernie Mac, and it is cringe fest when it oh, came out. Yeah, I can't no, imagine I, it got better I now. remember seeing it. I've seen it. It's terrible. It's rough. It's, it's real bad. Um, so the third, <laughs> this third entry on the, you know, the meet the family kind of meet the parents kind of deal. Uh, we've got him going with his wife girlfriend. It's kind of it, it gets the impression it's somewhere east coast sort of southish maybe even um i mean i get virginia vibes i don't know if that's where they are like virginia south carolina something like that it's yeah but also if they were like new hampshire i'd be like yeah i buy that too um but anyway vibes wise it's kind of like northern south ish so goes and meets the family they are very welcoming very nice the brother is a bit of a brother but the parents are great. They're very lovely, weird, but great. And then you get these little, little like, wait, something's not right. Wait, what's going on? And then it all comes to a head. The family runs a family business where they lure in African-Americans and more or less suck out their soul. And use their body as a host for some white person who wants to live out some weird, creepy, for lack of a better word, mandingo fantasy. Yeah, and that's about or... the only word for that. Huh? That's about the only word for that. All right, cool. Uh, and or just get a body that's in better shape because they're an old white person who doesn't take care old, of they're their... They're an old rich husk. whitey. Yeah, they're old rich whitey. So... Yeah, it, it all comes to head in a fantastic scene, which I will have in the description. It's fantastic. It definitely is something. You think something's up. You didn't think that much of something was up. And when it hits you, it hits you hard. It hits you good. It makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. And it's fucking awesome. They do, they do such a good job with so many of the actors kind of dropping the pretense and being honest, finally. Yeah. I, that, that's the greatest reveal is that like also the way the or like the younger brother you're kind of like all right fuck this kid anyway like i yeah. i already kind of thought you were a dick but like the, the girlfriend's mom, change cool. the mom kind of does and the dad's one is like pretty like oh fuck something bad's about to happen the daughter or the the girlfriend holds out so long and when she drops it it's such a fucking pin drop yeah it's like such a quarter turn it's like ah oh, fuck like it's, even the the best part is the character kind of takes it in, as much as you can takes it in stride. He's like, shit, <laughs> like he's got this like, ah, crap, because <laughs> like, you know. I believe or like part of his brain has to be saying your boy was right because <laughs> his best friend before he left was like, dude, something's up. This ain't right. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> black alarm bells were going off in his head. <laughs> so 100 percent part of his brain's like, 
shit my homie was right <laughs> uh all right all Better right take it away in the last one last one the the probably the biggest biggest rug pull you get in all of game of thrones the red wedding is a uh, I think kind of one of the first big, big places in in the show before it went wildly off the rails, where it kind of reinforced no one is safe in this show because Rob Rob Stark seemed kind of invincible in some ways. Like he kind of had everything going for him mm-hmm. in many many ways, and he's. He was one of the few good characters in terms of like a morality yeah. look. Like, there's people who you could argue were good. Like, you could make the argument that Tyrion was good. Yeah, yeah kind of. It was definitely more conniving. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, like, when we're talking like a moral good guy, right? Yeah. You would yeah. think Rob's like, 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 if you were to look at like D&D alignment, Rob Stark is lawful good, full stop. Yeah. Like, there is no. There's no chaotic shit going on. No, no, no. That man is like literally letter kills his, some of his own bannermen or has some of his own bannermen hung for killing traitors because of the way they went about it and yeah. how he did not find it morally acceptable. Yeah, it was. It, it, we're better that we're better than that. We will not do such a thing. Like he he said it and he meant it. Like he's one of the few characters that has genuine integrity of the fucking show. Yeah, he is his father's son. Yeah, like. And, and just, just like his father, <laughs> he gets absolutely fucking bodied for it. He gets absolutely blasted because he doesn't expect treachery. And has him and his whole crew hosed. And I don't love seeing the pregnant wife stabbed in front of him like that. That is honestly the most unset- one of the more unsettling things I've, I've watched. Yep. Just like, oh my god! Like, um, and yeah, it's it. It really was kind of like the the turning point, I think, of the show in some ways, where it's like, no one is no safe. No one is safe. Yeah, yeah no one Everybody is safe. Everybody secretly thought that fucking uh, Sean Bean was it's Sean die. Bean. It's Sean Bean. He's known for dying. Yeah, he's kind like, of. It's kind of what he's great at. That like that part of be, us were always thinking that. Yeah, like. Nobody like everybody's like, oh no, like you know, Edward Stark is dead. It's like a, it's a big moment in the show, but it's fucking Sean Bean. Yeah, you, like, you weren't like blown the fuck up. You weren't like, oh my god, I can't. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like it, I mean, it's still sad. It still carries weight, yeah. but you kind of like part of your brain knew, like you just you kind of knew that it was gonna happen, so we let it go. But then that happens. It's like, oh oh my god. Um, and it's not like it, it's it's grisly. It's not clean. It's irreverent. Like it is. Right. It is the golden boy of the show, and they just crucify his ass. <laughs> he gets fucking wrecked. He gets absolutely <laughs> rinsed. Like he gets rinsed in the most unsanctimonious manner possible. He doesn't get to fight. There's no. no fight. He just gets riddled with crossbow bolts. He and just... all of his boys get fucking dropped. Yeah, all, like all his boys are drinking at a fucking wedding. They're excited, and the, they just get turned on and burned. Like they they parade around his like his wolf's head on a stick. Uh, like, no. They chop off his head and the wolf's head, and they sew the wolf's head to him. Oh, that's that's right, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> Which, God, even worse. Damn. <laughs> like, yeah, no, nah, it is. Christ, it's it's brutal. Like it is, it is probably the most savage moment of the show. And it just, it just hits you out of left field. Yeah, it's like, oh my god! <laughs> Wait, what? So, yeah, <laughs> there were no survivors. <laughs> I've been watching nice. some Futurama lately. I love Morbo. <laughs> I mean, that's a reference to Princess Bride. <laughs> There will be no survivors. That is not what I was going for, but fair. <laughs> no, but I'm saying that that's what that's from. Either which way, then they keep the, the king. Blah. Wow, this transition got hit the shit fan fast. The things that keep us coming back is you listening to those ad reads, which fuel our coffers. So have a listen. Do you wish that you could engage in reckless acts of wanton violence? 
Do you wish that you had the confidence and constitution of a Navy SEAL? Do you wish that criminal liability was wildly subjective? If those ring true, action movies might just be for you. With plenty of morally questionable motives and plots that sacrifice substance for silent explosions, action movies appeal to those base allergists that make us want to make things go boom. So what are you waiting for, killer? The day isn't going to save itself. Welcome back, everybody. Before we get carried away on uh, things that we've been watching or think you should watch. We we have one thing we have to note. Well, yes. Let's note that first. Yep. Um, R.I.P. to Akira Toriyama, the OG creator of Dragon Ball. Without this man... I would argue we don't have anime or manga as we would have it today, let nope. alone shonen as a form of representation. No, not not in nearly the same capacity. Probably not in nearly the same popularity. Dragon I... Ball was whether whether you were an anime fan or not. Dragon Ball has probably influenced something you've watched or several things you would have watched. Yeah, like it's Dragon Ball is one of the first anime that kind of made anime a phenomenon. Like, yeah, yeah I, I would say I would stop. Say so, yeah. <laughs> I, I I don't think you could overstate the the importance of Dragon Ball as far as that little niche of the world is existing. Yeah, yeah. So, absolute legend, R.I.P. R.I.P. Time to get gather the Dragon Balls. Until then, we did skip over a couple things that we meant to. Uh, mentioned in our main segment which is some of the honorable mentions the ones that you know about that are bangers but also they have become so cottage industry when you think of you know reveals that we didn't think they were bother mentioning but we still want to mention them to show our respects first up i am am your your father. father i mean you can't get more iconic than vader yelling at a handless Luke about daddy issues. <laughs> then. They blew it up! Planet of the Apes. It's, it's all gone to shit. That was such a great reveal, too, because the whole entire movie, you think, you do believe he's on a different planet. He somehow went yeah, somewhere yeah. else. He's, you know, he's on a different land. He needs to get back to Earth. It's like, oh no, you're still there. It's and, just very wrong. Yeah, that taking that hope, just destroying that hope air balloon of getting out of there and the realization, it, all that has going to pass is so fucking awesome. Yeah. And last and but while, not least. And while we're still talking about Charlton Heston, two in a row, baby. Soil and green is people. The movie did not age great in many directions. Noticeably, the amount of domestic abuse against women is just fucking outlandish like i kind of want to go back and watch the you amount just of want to take a, ca- a tally of how many slaps there it's are a lot women. and it doesn't it's not endemic of whether good or bad it's just, just whether they have a dick or not like i i do think women slap women in that movie to be fair but not nearly as much as men's women in that movie. and i don't think a woman slaps a man once in that movie which is you know hey, for the that's not equality yeah but the movie's the ending and it's build up to that point is fantastic of man how are these rich magnates going to solve this problem how are they going to do this how are this coming out what are we doing here oh god in this dystopian universe the food that we've been getting fed to help survive and keep people alive is the people who couldn't get the food protein is protein <laughs> protein is protein Speaking of things that are things, uh, what is a show that you've watched show up in your eyeballs? I watched the... I, I'm into this series one episode in. Shogun. Um, and the there is a... So it was originally a novel. It was done as a miniseries in like 1980 or something. A long-ass time ago. Um, they are doing a a modern series for it on hulu it goes hard i am here for it um it's i was i had, I had a, a tiny worry at the start 
because I looked at language options and it's like English. I'm like, we're in fucking feudal Japan. <laughs> if you've got people speaking English on my screen, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna stop watching the show immediately. <laughs> they do not. The people that should be speaking Japanese are speaking Japanese. Yay! They they the one place they flub it is like people are speaking Portuguese and they're speaking English. It's like okay. I'll 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 whatever, I'll wave this. <laughs> I'll allow it. From yeah, one but, white nation for another, sure. Yeah. I mean they, they do they do a thing where like the main English speaking character, like he speaks fluent Portuguese. And so the big thing is like the Portuguese and the Spanish have um have basically been putting like strongholds in Japan. Mm-hmm. It's like a, a big part of the plot. And so there's an, a guy who's English who can pretend he's Portuguese, but he refuses to pretend he's Catholic. Um, Weird. Yeah, I mean, man's got to have his morals, I guess. Um, what they do such an interesting and a very good job of mm-hmm. is doing um, language discrepancy. Because, oh, cool. I mean, most of the people who speak Japanese don't fucking speak Portuguese. So, like, what's this fucker babbling about? Um, <laughs> and so the inter- the interesting thing is, is how much they play with like body language. Okay. And they do they do a really good job with a lot of it. The acting is also just it's super good. It's super on point. They do a terrific job creating tension. Like the the show is just fucking money. Nice. Like the start is a little bit slow. It it puts a lot of pieces in place, but I. I'm fucking into it. I'm, yeah, I'm I'm in for it. They also just in the first episode they cook a dude alive. <laughs> they just like they say, "Well, we're you gonna have me at boiled man." Yeah, meat. they just put a dude in this big fucking like iron cauldron and cook his ass. Like they just cook him alive. Like, oh my do, god. Do they do they then see what he tastes like? No, they don't eat him. But there's no. apparently just like one of the weird Japanese officials like just has a fascination with death. So he just kind of draws out killing someone to see what they look like as they die. Goddamn. Yeah, it's super grisly. Um, <laughs> like, at one point, a dude speaks out of turn and is just, like, beheaded on the spot. It's just like, okay. <laughs> hey, yo. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's... Yeah, but the, the, the actor acting is superb. It's 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 really good, um. Yeah, I I I could glaze the show for a little while longer, but I don't think I need to. So, just uh, just give it a watch. It's great. Well, things that I would not recommend giving a watch, sadly, are three thousand years of longing. I was very hopeful for this. I love both the actors involved in this film, and I love the director that is George Miller. Uh, I think the actors are Tilda Swinton and um, crap. What the fuck is his name? Who's the guy that played Will Smith's character in the most recent version of Suicide Squad? British black guy was supposed to be James Bond, but oh, uh, 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 not technically the same guy, but yeah, yeah, uh, 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 oh my god, I Wasn't can see him, I can Deadshot? hear him. Idris Elba. Idris Elba. I thought they both played Deadshot though. No, he plays. He plays someone else. Really? Very. Yes, it's not Deadshot. It, it is. It is named differently. I'll, I'll, I'll check. Hold on. Oh, Bloodsport. Yeah. Okay. Very, very similar. Is a bit different. Yeah. I'll take it. Uh, I didn't realize that. The more I know. So in 3000 years of longing, we've got Tilda Swinton, who's this like professor and then she runs into a gin and then blah, blah, blah happens. The amount of blah, blah, blah is a lot too much for me. I love the kind of ponderous nature. It's beautifully shot. I'll give it that. But the whole entire movie is like exposition from one character to another. It's beautiful. It's interesting, but it's not. It doesn't do anything. It's just a guy telling a character stories for like the better part of two hours. Eh. I think you can do better on average. Eh. It's beautiful because it's George Miller and he knows what he's doing with a camera. 
or hires people as he who knows what, what to do with the camera. camera. So Beyond it was beautiful. That. It was interesting, but ultimately, meh. The other flight or the other movie I saw on my flight uh, back from Chicago was Bottoms. Look, okay. this movie's not good, <laughs> but it is hilarious <laughs> and fucking weird. Uh, very much this kind of absurdist tongue in cheek comedy about a couple lesbians that make a fight club to get laid. It's really <laughs> stupid, and disingenuous, but also funny as shit. I, yeah, it's have you know have an edible, have a beer, watch this movie, and laugh. That's what it's there for, and I respect that. That's what it's there for, and it it does a pretty good job. It's very silly. It doesn't take itself too seriously. You definitely shouldn't either. Um, yeah, just enjoy it. It's wacky. Excellent. As we kind of wind down here, Broskinkowski, uh, do you think of anything that you've listened to, played recently that should the people should know about? I I have been pretty static this last week, so um, although there is actually. One moment. Hold the phone. One moment. I forgot this came out. I have to pick this up today. Yay! Um, all right. So there, there. Pray tell. It's it's really not something I would normally. It's not my usual, my usual part of the course. Um, called backpack battles. It's kind of like a. It's it's a. It is a. It's an auto battler. There we go. That's oh, okay. Um, and it's like an inventory management thing. It's it's very basic, but there is a lot of kind of creative strategy to it and kind of fun synergies. And there was a demo that got put out forever ago. I played a lot of that demo <laughs> unrepentantly, and it did it did kind of a really cool little matchmaking thing where it would take snapshots of people's inventories on the same round as you and just make you fight them. Hmm. So it has the illusion effectively of being like an online like versus game. I thought it was just is. really clever. Um, and the actual game came out two days ago. I forgot. It, I knew it came out recently, but it, it actually came out. There's like, instead of two classes, there's now four, and there's a whole bunch of new shit. So I'm absolutely going to pick this up and play some more. I uh, might too. It's it's adorable. It's very basic. It's It's a good gimmick. I like it. Well, I have... Okay, so this was Backpack Battles. Well, sadly, I don't have a cool game to recommend. Just an old artist that I can never stop listening to. I love me, and will continue to love me, some Andrew Bird. Uh, this week I've been finding myself listening to the kind of strained strings of fake palindromes. The song is great. It's it's very much for your kind of up their own butthole tweed wearing hipster motherfucker such as myself. I would highly recommend it. So yeah. Give it a listen. It's only like three minutes. It's so much fun. Well, all right. And that is gonna be our episode, everybody. So thank you for tuning in. And if you enjoyed it, please feel free to like, comment share and subscribe but don't forget new episodes of super pros bros come out the first and third saturday of every month bye, bye.